You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for December 17th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where have you put up your nativity scene yet? Is a question people routinely ask each other. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. It's true. It's true. It's, it's very true. It's mm-hmm. really odd. And I have to apologize, I guess, to somebody out there for my attitude toward Christmas. I sometimes feel like a total Grinch. And I'm not a Grinch. I love Christmas music. Uh-huh. I'm a believing Christian. And... Yes. You know, church is important to me and so forth, but the process of pulling boxes of clutter out of your storage area and putting it around your house on purpose yes, um, is something that I just can't do because I already have enough clutter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've, it, Drift Glass has reminded me periodically over the past five years how much better it is now that the children are you know, 14 and up instead of four and up. Yeah. I mean, hey, when I you can... first started coming to this house, our living room was just a playroom. You know, I, I that know what was the, it. I know what the living room carpet looks like now. Now, um, yes. <laughs> used to, I, I used to just take a snow shovel and just, you know, dig yeah. my way through. And yeah. But, and, and I had to keep telling you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. This and is. I, I, you would come down from Chicago to visit us, mm-hmm. and I would just be in tears as to what the house looked like. And I had three children under eight years old when you first started seeing me. Yes. And one of them had autism, and two of them were just wacky girls and ah! wanted, <laughs> wanted, you know, to set up a diorama right. in front of the television set. <laughs> and 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 all I remember are. Two little girls in footy pajamas coming yep. to the train in the van, in the in the rickety old van to pick yep. me up. That's yep. that's my memory. I mean, yeah. you know, and now all those toys are uh, in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, right. No, my phone is, I don't even need to take my purse with me. Everything I need is in the cloud. <laughs> Drift class, I just want to ask you one other question about this week. Because sure. I'm going through... Um, prepping and i i told you we weren't going to talk about this but i'm prepping <laughs> the end of the year stuff for Kurt sure. Myers and yeah, yeah. trying to f- remember what happened this year and realizing the arizona recount was this year it was it was this year this what this happened year. to time what what well, exactly see, happened to time well we have another podcast called science fiction university where all of this is explained <laughs> suffice it to we say an episode in like 10 months. Oh, no, we've done it. We, I think we, our last one was like three months ago. Two or three oh, months ago. man. Yeah, because time is is meaningless. Yeah. We're, we're just floating. Um, well, the crush of events coupled with the, the sort of speedy transition of people, um, coupled with the fact that we don't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. We don't. Um, I literally go to church. But, you know, that's pretty much it. We, you know, we have a very... Um, uh, we could extend our social life slightly. I mean, when people come to town, when listeners come to town yeah. who, are, who are friends of ours, um, we go to coffee and we you know, go out to dinner every now and then. But really, it's just the way time has been and the sheer colossal number of events. Mm-hmm. There it, it really is a Watergate summer aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. if you remember, you know, Watergate was cooking along for a while until it took off and mm-hmm. then it took off really fast. Yeah. And then there was a bunch of resignations. And then there was the big resignation. Yeah. And that all happened in a very short time window. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. in history, you know, looking back over the great span of history, it seems like that should have lasted, you know, but it felt really at the time, I'm I'm going back many, many years, it certainly felt weirdly compressed. Mm. And, you know, and and wired into that is this war that's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so there's, it's, it's a matter of, and it, it is a matter of the sheer amount of input coming in to our brains, I believe mm-hmm. that our brain is telling us this can't all be happening at one time. Right. <laughs> we can't right. all have a, 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 a boom economy and inflation and a bunch of hysterics on, and plus the nature of our job. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, you more than me, quite a, quite a bit more. I mean, you you strap on the hazmat suit and and wade into this shit every day. So, you know, we have a routine and I think routine keeps us from, you know, yep, it does. going going ballistic. Ritual but, and routine. Yeah. But it it is important to remember and it's also it's it's, you know, 68 degrees here yesterday and it's December. Yeah. So it's yeah. also a sort of body is telling you it's a different season than it actually is. Well, and and that is you know, the, the constant threat of climate change now becoming incredibly local and incredibly real. Yeah. Uh, the roof that was ripped off of the Amazon warehouse was 75 miles from us. Yeah. I want to thank those people who wrote us and said, we hope you're OK. We are, we're fine. We're fine. Uh, but, you know, and and Amazon telling people they couldn't go home or they yeah. couldn't evacuate during right. during a tornado. Disaster. During a natural disaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, no. That's the the triangle shirtwaist fire of yeah, exactly, and and it's happening in twenty twenty one. These everything old is new again, and then yeah. you have to adjust to mass media and having it thrown in your face all day. And no wonder I close my laptop and turn off my phone on Sundays. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. So it, it is it it is shocking to me mm-hmm. that this all happened in one year. Yeah, but it is also when you think about it, it's like, well, yeah, it should have happened. You know, these people, as far as I'm concerned, should all be in prison. You know, four months ago, five months ago, we should have impeached Trump for porn star hush money in 2017. Yeah, yeah. in well, in February of 2017, then he would have been the thrice impeached president who was yeah, never right. removed because right. the Republicans would never tolerate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but and and I think what also makes it a little tiring is is knowing how this movie is going to play out. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, you just, mean how the right is going yeah, to react and, exactly. and circle the wagons and yeah. be impenetrable. If, yes. Once you understand, if you, God help you, if you do, once you understand the right well enough, that you could actually imitate them, you know, mm-hmm. letter perfect, do a letter perfect imitation of a conservative on a radio program. I could mm-hmm. call into a local radio program and be, be a conservative or libertarian every day and no one oh, would yeah. know the difference. No one would know it was you. Yeah. Um, but once you sort of have a, uh, as a writer, a character assessment of who this character is mm-hmm. and what their motivations are, it is absolutely, it's not hard to predict what's going to come next. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there is, um, I, and I'm not going to circle too far off of our prepared remarks because yeah. I have a, I have like 40 pages of things I have to read verbatim <laughs> or else. No, he our, doesn't. <laughs> no. Um, but there are, um, I do listen to the, the the Never Trump podcast. I'm not going to dwell on that today other than to say I listen to the, the Lincoln Project podcast, which is hilarious in some regards. But part of their thing is how exhausting it is to have shouted down in, into the abyss and warned people <laughs> for, for like a couple of years now and nobody's listening. And part of me just wants to slap the fuck out of those people. But part of me says, and I, I've said this on social media, and I've, I've extended an open invitation to them, which will not be accepted, is if you really are perplexed as to why pointing to a giant forest fire and telling people in the path of that fire, there is a fire, you should get out of the way, or at least stop making it worse. Stop lobbing you know, jelly gasoline into it, and they won't stop doing it, and they look at you like you're insane. Um and you used to be friends with them. Why don't you talk to some people who've been shouting into exactly the same abyss for 20 years instead mm-hmm. of two years mm-hmm. or 30 years? We can tell you why this will fail. We can tell you exactly why it'll fail. You know, we've gone through the five stages already. <laughs> you know, we, we understand exactly what's going to happen because this is the machine that you built. It's doing exactly what you built it to do. You mm-hmm. just don't run it anymore, which is mm-hmm. why it's out of control. It's It's like a power tool. That you had firmly in your hands, but now it's slipped out and it's chasing you all over the workshop, trying to, you know, taking chunks out of your leg. Well, of course it is. Chopping shit up is what it does. It's just you don't control it anymore, right. which is what we warned you was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I say it with all, you know, with all uh, collegial uh, respect, you really should have, re- if you're really concerned about this, you really should have some actual liberals on your show. I mean, OG, Digby level. Mm-hmm. Nicole Sanders level, Bob Seska level, liberals on your show to explain to you exactly why this is happening and exactly why it's never going to get any better, <laughs> why there's no cure for it. it, it there's not going to be, it won't peter out. 
Um, it'll just keep going and going until it collapses or until they die. Of, or until they, know, kill, natural they causes. kill off their own audience. I mean, yeah. they're doing a really good job of that. But there's no end game that involves clever words making them stop doing terrible things because mm-hmm. they can't stop doing terrible things. Mm-hmm. They're incapable of it. I, and, I want to I want to um, amend what I just said about killing off their audience because right. with all of the anti-vax mandate stuff that's going on in Fox, we know from last week that se- seventy five is the average age of a Fox News regular viewer. Yes. Yes. And looking at the statistics on vaccination, the best group of Americans for getting vaccinated is senior citizens. They are as close to 100 percent having had one shot as any group will ever get in the United States of America. Right. They're they're in the 90s in terms of getting at least one shot. Mm -hmm. And. I don't know the politics of my knitting group, but I sure do know the age bra- bracket. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. They're all vaxxed. They're all boosted. They're every one of them has mm-hmm. had as many shots as they can get. Yes. And regardless of how, whether they watch Hannity at night or not, they, <laughs> they for themselves have taken care of it. Mm-hmm. And so the extent to which we know that the audience is in on it and that they know they're being lied to and don't care because politics is sport and we just want to win with our people. Mm -hmm. And those people, whether they're baby eating Democrats or Black Lives Matter rioters or however you want to villainize them today, are the other team. Yeah. And oh, I did. But but we're not going to risk you know, getting COVID because no. we're privileged to get that shot. And that's our thing. Well, there so. are a bunch of people who aren't. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. swath, especially the people who are going to be Omicron, you know. Yeah, who are gonna, right. Because, uh, well, you know, I got one shot because my grandkids insisted, but screw mm-hmm. them. And and th- that, that's it's looking like you have to have two in a booster. Right, right. To, to ride that out. And you and um, I will have a shot every six weeks or six yeah. months or whatever it takes. I, mean, I will put my ass up to the drive through window every day if necessary. <laughs> and they'll keep telling me, hey, this no, is a... No, sir, we don't need that. <laughs> yeah, this is a Taco Bell drive through sir. We keep telling you. And no, you, we don't do it that way. I did. I just did, in light of that, not in light of that, but on the same subject, uh, this afternoon, just for me, mm-hmm. I did a post about the difference between brainwashing and complicity. Oh, wow. See, if you've been lied to and humiliated and you've suffered materially over and mm-hmm. over again for decades because of the bullshit, which some easily fact check con man or huckster or fraud or lunatic on the radio or on TV told you, and all you had to do to make it stop was turn the fucking channel, mm-hmm. then you're not a victim. You're a, co- <laughs> you're a co-conspirator. Yeah. You, yeah. you, keep getting lied to and you keep letting people piss in your face and your liberal friends all say, please stop doing that. Here's the truth. And you keep laughing at them. Like they're the dumbasses. Like you're on some big secret and you go right back to getting screwed by people who hate you. Mm-hmm. That's not brainwashing. That's complicity. Mm-hmm. And I have no pity for you because I know there's no, this is all self-inflicted. It's all your own goddamn fault and there's no cure for it. Mm-hmm. There's no other than that that classic addict hitting rock bottom. Yeah. Um, cure. There is no rock bottom here. There is no bottom. Your friends could be dropping like flies from COVID. You'd still watch Hannity every fucking night. Mm-hmm. There's no cure to that other than, you know, shuffling off this mortal coil, and and burying the Republican Party at the crossroads with a sprig of holly through its chest. Mm-hmm. So anyway, let's get back to our regularly scheduled show. When you want to tell me about <laughs> Axios, I was telling you about how Axios admitted that I was right without yeah. using my name or congratulating me in any way. Yeah. But they did have an article about how the Republican primaries are going to be lit. <laughs> it turns out Axios has discovered that in state and local races, uh, there are Republican primaries between regular Republicans and Trump Republicans. Oh, no. And they're getting very nasty toward each other. Uh huh. And yet... On all of the debate stages, no one is willing to say who is the president of the United States. Right. That's the thing. (laughs) That's the part. It's just, it's, you know, if I, I, 
in, in my mind, this is this should be like watching a Marx Brothers movie. Yeah, where yeah. everyone's insane and no one gets hurt. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, but it's mm-hmm. actually happening in a political party in this country that has bids fair to uh, to achieve some degree of um, seizure of the uh, levers of government in about a year. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is blocking everything everyone's trying to do until then. So it's not funny. It is terrifying, uh, but it is. You see, the, the, it's predictable. That's the thing. It is not the people who continue to pretend to be shocked. Can you believe the hypocrisy? Well, it's not hypocrisy if you understand how deeply their brains are broken. Because everything is permissible because of the liberal eternal enemy must be stopped at all costs. So mm-hmm. whatever I have to say, whatever I have to do, whatever I have to lie, I'm, not, I'm lying for a good reason. Because I have to get in power because the liberal enemy must be stopped at any cost. I have to storm the Capitol because the liberal enemy must be stopped. I have to overthrow the presidency because the liberal must be stopped. That's what that's the crazy little voice running through their head 24 hours a day. Uh, Drift class, why don't you talk about Andrew Sullivan for a bit? Oh, just for 90 seconds. <laughs> uh, because if you were worried that somehow America's most famous gay, Tory, conservative, libertarian, Catholic, 19th century phrenologist would run out of stupid shit to say, you don't need to worry anymore. Because he's full of today, for example, he wanted to tell us all about how the coloreds are doing. Um, in a tweet and it's about San Francisco mayor, uh, going to do cracking down on crime and drug deal, drug markets and et cetera, et cetera. And what does Andrew Sullivan say to all that? This is a big deal. The terrible legacy of black lives matter. Soaring crime, murder, and mayhem is finally being tackled. That's Andrew what Sullivan. What a racist asshole. Yes, he is. Andrew Sullivan is a racist asshole. Oh, but here's, here's a, a little truth bomb. Might shock you, blue gal. Uh-huh. Andrew Sullivan has always been a racist <laughs> asshole. <laughs> well, I knew he had no, he, he literally had no idea what the Confederacy was all about. No, at all. He, he had to be. Or any sense of why, you know. Wealth inequity in the United States between blacks and whites existed. No. He just no. had no, clearly no concept of that. And everyone who's a Republican is simply a civilized, sure. his definition of civilization. No, he, he reverse engineered his conservatism to fit the American Republican conservative right. movement. Right, right. In the American Republican conservative movement for you know the last half century or more has been a white supremacist, racist movement yeah. getting more and more yeah. obvious about it. Uh-huh. And the more obvious they get, the more they lie about the past, the more they uh-huh. lie about the Civil War, which is why every dumb fuck racist on Twitter or in real life, you know, the Democrats are the part of the KKK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you call and him Kevin Cruz. And then history. Yeah. yeah. With fake history. Yeah. And Andrew yeah. Sullivan just wouldn't believe that the, the fantasy American history that he invented for himself to justify being a conservative and gay – in mm-hmm. America, mm-hmm. Uh, didn't happen. Right. So he had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the to the point of acknowledging there was a civil war in this country. It was over slavery. <laughs> and, and there was a reconstruction period that failed. And then there was a long history of Jim Crow. And that's still with us. He just, on, on, a, on a molecular level, cannot accept that. Because that means he's, he's as big a dumbass as we all think he is. Mm-hmm. So he just, well... Thank God we're finally tackling the BLM problem, which is crime, murder, and mayhem. Crime, you know? yes, right. And welfare and unwed mothers, too. You know how those yeah, people are. Because Reagan is still here yeah. speaking to Andrew Sullivan on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, daily Coast had an art article this week uh, about Mitch McConnell and Textgate. We haven't talked about Textgate yet. No. Turns out, as, as Swankette says, Oh no! Major other major networks are figuring out that Fox News is garbage all of a sudden. What? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Daily Coast was pointing out that the texts that were sent to Mark Meadows were former colleagues of his in the House. Mm-hmm. No senator has been found to have sent texts to Mark Meadows. So the reason these guys had Mark Meadows' personal phone number was he was a House member. And and they knew him personally. So um, apparently Mitch McConnell is uh, seen to be secretly gleeful about this because he would really like to see the Freedom Caucus cleaned out of the House. 
Mitch McConnell is uh, seen as a rhino now by some of the uh, yeah. uh, Freedom Caucus people because he wants to make a deal on the debt ceiling and, right. uh, you know, all these other stupid things that he wants to do. Uh, rhino Mitch McConnell was not on my bingo card no. for well, 2021. But, but remember, eventually... <laughs> Eventually, yeah. it's Everybody's just a chicken a farmer and his yep. 12 followers. That's it. Eventually, That's it. Exactly. it's just that you never be pure enough. It, it's, right. it, it's a right. distillery contest. Right. So, and Mitch McConnell's now out. So, yeah. Hey. And, and Mitch McConnell does not want to sit in the Senate and not be minority leader at worst. Right. That's if he's not in leadership, he's retiring. Right. So, uh, this this idea that um, we're going to clean this out is actually good news for Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, <laughs> resistance hero. Resistance you know. hero, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then you and I had a chat last night about how Liz Cheney comes from a family that excels at revenge. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, t- you know, trench warfare. They really yeah. have no problem with that. She'll, she'll shoot you in the face just like that. She'll you know? shoot you in the face just yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and I pointed out that Liz Cheney has all the Iraqi blood money she'll ever need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, she really yeah. doesn't. Um, and I think she'll have a forever platform as that brave Republican who stood up for American democracy. Uh-huh. She does not need her shitty house seat in this shitty Republican caucus. No. Run by shit for brains Kevin McCarthy. No. To be somebody. No. F- well, all she has to do is look at the TV mm-hmm. and see that. Another half-assed, dumbass Republican congressperson named Joe Scarborough got his own three-hour show right, on right, liberal MSNBC exactly. every goddamn day. Right. There's much more money and, frankly, much more influence to be had yeah, yeah. being a nice in-house Republican at a cable news station than being, you know, as you put it, I believe you put it this way, the very, very, very low bar over which all of her colleagues keep tripping. Yeah, that, that was uh, someone else on Twitter, not me. But mm-hmm. but that uh, that leads to a question I have for you, Drift Glass, about sure. cable networks. Yeah. I just think the 24-hour news thing is an experiment that's utterly failed. Oh, yeah. No, it has. I mm-mm. And and I really I really wish that cable networks, not talking about Fox, of course, but CNN and MSNBC should be running The Masked Singer, Dancing with the Stars and Bachelorette during the day. Yeah. Well, and well, make yeah. the money that they want to make off of stuff that average Americans, <laughs> sorry, folks, I'm not talking to anyone listening to this podcast. No. But, you know, the big audiences are for things that that are not talking heads during the day. And that's the way it used to be. CBS funded Walter Cronkite as a nonprofit entity by having entertainment during the day. Sure. Well, and... But you're, you're, you know, that's long ago and far away. It that's, is long that's ago the, and That's far broadcast away. television. That's, that's uh, yeah. Ferris Doctrine television. And I guess we now have all these niche things. And one of the yeah. niche markets that they're going for is the news junkie. And, and we're that. I mean, that's what we have on all day. Well, so. and, and when you think about MSNBC is owned by NBC and Comcast, right? Yep. yep. How many other shows does Comcast own? All of them. Yeah. So, so you're, do, why put your weekly midday news show in competition with your other products. Right. You know, you've already subsected the market so that you're catching everybody. It is. It's niche. It's niche programming. And And because you have 57 channels, you can do that. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the niche that that they're grabbing are, you know, a, a a ring of people who live around Washington, DC. Yeah. Um, who, who are, who live and die by this shit and who Mm -hmm. really believe, you know, political consulting, blah, blah, blah. So that's the market they want. That's the market they have. The problem they have is, the problem that we have is that mentality, those people continue to set the agenda for what gets right. discussed for the Overton window of television. Mm-hmm. What's acceptable mm-hmm. to discuss on TV? What's acceptable to discuss in the public? And as we see from our, our local Fox News affiliate, our local Sinclair affiliate, and our local Republican RAG, those standards get filtered right down to the right down to the grassroots. Right. Right. So they 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 are a small they they're small but they cast a powerful shadow, and they pay really well. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they they do the thing that um, I've talked about a lot, and that we got a funny you know exchange on the social media this week uh, about uh, a certain Mona Charon 
Um, <laughs> they, they, they grant credibility. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if you're on X, Y, Z, then you have a certain level of cachet. Then mm -hmm. you can sell a book. Then you can make more money. Then you can drive a million or more people to your podcast or your website or whatever that, whatever you're selling this week. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this, you know, the bulwark website pop podcast universe might as well just be a division of MSNBC. Right. Right. Even though those people shit talk MSNBC when the cameras are off all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's corporate media and corporate media yep. is not run thinking by hedge about funds. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and so we have to talk about the Chris Hayes interview last yes, night. Uh, please. We're recording on Thursday. Uh, January 6th rally organizers, they call themselves Dustin yeah. Stockton and Jennifer Lawrence. Um, and I do not know what Chris Hayes's staff did to vet these people. I know what I would have done to vet these people. <laughs> they watched CNN the night before, you know. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. they were on, right? Ooh, ooh, or, or they're making the rounds. They're selling a book or they're selling something. They're making the rounds. They're selling themselves. People. They're yeah. selling their innocence and they're being never Trumpers now. There's yeah. nothing they love more than a recalcitrant Republican Trumper to... You know, look like, oh, they can be saved, you know. And so here come these two people. And, you know, at least look at their contract with the Trump campaign and find out yeah. what they did for Trump before you t have them on and credulously let them say, we have all the goods on January 6th and the insurrection and we're going to spill it to the committee. Well, and I, I was walking past the uh, the small black and white television, which is all we have in our home. No. Um, <laughs> Last That's night, not true. When Mister Mister Dustin Stockton was on uh, Stockton was on television, and the thing that caught my attention immediately was he looked like like an insufficiently medicated lunatic mm -hmm. who was looking every which way all the time. His, his eyes never stopped moving. He was darting left, right, up, down, up, down, left, right. He never looked at the camera. He looked like I know they're coming to get me. I know they're around the corner. And it's like, oh, this just reeks of. I can't be trusted at all. Right. And um, I'm paranoid that either a Trumper or uh, Hillary Clinton are going to come kill me at any moment. Right. Right. So mm, I'm just vouchsafing this secret information to you. And but then I'll the go on. The thing is that they, that this, the pursuit of this for Chris Hayes was allegedly to have a conversation with someone who could be reached. Yes. And the end of the interview was Mr. Stockton saying, okay, I have now conceded that the election wasn't stolen. So right. you have to concede that it's a Russia hoax. Right. That's right. Both sides. And <laughs> Both sides. Yes, you, yeah, you have to. And I, I did like that Chris Hayes in, the, in all of the talking over everyone said, you haven't watched any of my coverage, uh -huh. which clearly he hasn't. Um, but Rachel Maddow, after the interview, you know, she was really dubious about this interview for two days. The day before when Chris Hayes said, I'm going to have them on. And yep. she's like, really? Huh? Okay. And the next day, how do you feel about having the interview? Oh, I don't know. I don't know whether I like, accomplished anything. You didn't. You gave them the credibility of your show and your network. Right. And Give it away. these two, Give it away. quote unquote, rally organizers, again, Look at their contract. What were they supposed to do for the Trump campaign or the Trump White House? Mm -hmm. If it was hanging banners behind the stage that had red, white, and blue on them mm -hmm. uh, and making sure the podium was dusted and the microphones worked, because that's what event organizers do. And that's yeah. what they allegedly are. They made sure the America's Freedom Kids didn't get paid. Seriously. You know, mm -hmm. Whatever. It, whatever. But if they're expert media and event organizers, quote unquote, one thing they did know how to do was appear to be having a conversation when they were really selling bullshit. Right. Yeah. And, they, whatever you know, they do, they suck at it. Unless you're right. Yeah. It's hanging banners. Hanging banners. I mean, it just made me think of Bill Hicks and marketers, you know, yeah. <laughs> that that they they're really Satan spawn who do accomplish nothing for our society. And they belong at the Macy's perfume counter because they can make a product look good. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they have any more insider intel about January 6th than the wait staff at Trump's golf club. No. They just look like event organizers. Right. Right. So we were tweeting about this interview, this really shit show of an interview last night. And... <laughs> 
Zach Mania on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for replying and saying, followed by Mona Charon. Am I on acid? <laughs> yeah. Help, Pro Left Podcast. Well, we're here for we you, Zach help. Mania. We yeah. can't help. I, I cannot verify without a drug test whether or not you were on acid last well, night or I, not. But I will tell you the look on Drift Glass's face when that interview was over and immediately on the air comes Mona Sharon. <laughs> great. That's just <laughs> fucking great. You look so depressed. Well, thank Drift you. Glass, you look so depressed. Thank you for validating everything I think about cable television. <laughs> That you are there to f- toss your tattered cloak of credibility around these shitty, awful people who then go off to their podcast mm-hmm. with a whole bunch of people who think that they're credible now. Because, well, you know, he was on – she was on the Chris Hayes show. Yeah. Where they're on right. with liberals. You know, I maybe I can trust them more than the actual lunatics who are, you know, and who then just turn on you and put every knife in your back um, and do it with a calm tone of voice. Mm-hmm. They do it real nice. But just just the, the shit that they talk – about us and what we believe in and how stupid we are and how we need to do what they're telling us to do and how build back better is folly and spending money on shit is terrible and blah, 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 blah. Every week Mm -hmm. is, is fine. Go do that. But then if you're going to go, this is, this is the, this is what I call the Steve. You're talking about Mona Sharon at this point. Yeah. But I'm talking about all of them. You know, this is the Steve Schmidt thing, which is yeah. Steve Schmidt goes off and does something horrible and unforgivable and hypocritical and stupid or or just burns his own podcast down mm-hmm. or dumps all of his credibility to go off and work for a third party candidate after swearing he wouldn't do that or goes and covers up for a serial molester at the Lincoln Project mm-hmm. uh, for God knows how long. Every time he fucks up like that, they bring him right back because he's a friend of uh, Nicole Wallace. And they don't and he mention writes it. A, he writes a very smart entire blog post on Twitter. He does. That really He's, belong on a blog. <laughs> and and you know what? There are lots of people who can do that. Yeah. Uh, none of are. them <laughs> are as deeply uh, fucked up and valueless as Steve Schmidt. But there are a lot Steve of Schmidt, women on Twitter who could write that who don't have blue checks like Steve Schmidt does. Steve Schmidt, there's a whole lot of women who work at Crooks and Liars who could yeah. do that. Uh-huh. There's a whole lot of women named Digby who could do that. Yeah. yeah. But they don't, they're not friends with Nicole Wallace. They don't have a contributor contract at MSNBC, and therefore they don't constantly get their shitty re, uh, reputation rehabilitated. Uh-huh. And mo- you know that's money in the bank. And I mean literally, that's literally. millions of dollars in the bank because you went on a cable news show and they groomed you and told all of their viewers, you can trust this guy. Look at this guy. Look how smart he is. He says things that are so intelligent that agree well, with you. But his, his his time in the trenches with Nicole Wallace, making sure that, you know, Sarah Palin didn't blow up the entire Republican Party yeah. in, in the summer of 2008. Mm-hmm. That was their job together. Right. So she doesn't forget her friend who helped her do that. No, of course not. And I, I, I'd be thrilled if they were friends uh off the fucking air but it's <laughs> but it's it's this and it this really does if you if you look into sort of the history of conservatism the history of 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 national review and weekly standard uh the, the, you know the 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 um Podhoritz family and the crystal family and there's it's just a terribly incestuous universe mm-hmm. where everyone always looks out for everyone else no matter how fucking awful they are because they're part of the conservative club and if you get a foot in the door you bring in 12 of your friends and and it's just and it 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 is that way on the right i accept that that's how it works but there is no equivalent to this on the left nope. there's no mentoring there are no special no programs money. That, there's, there's, the, the money isn't there there's no wing nut welfare it's not on the, the lift. richard mellon shape no bankroll no at all. There isn't. there's nothing equivalent and so when i see the incredibly valuable bandwidth on on the shitty half-assed liberal cable station being used to rehabilitate the reputations of people who should be out there knocking doors for democratic candidates mm-hmm. they have been wrong long enough and fouled their nest long enough that they no longer get any more mulligans but they just keep and i know i know i'm, I'm not going to change anything by saying that i'm just mm-hmm. saying in a universe where things were slightly more regimented and fair, mm-hmm. I would be seeing Digby on with with Chris Hayes. I'd be seeing right. you on with Chris Hayes. I'd be seeing some of your colleagues on with Chris Hayes. I, I don't would not have be the seeing... false eyelashes and eyeliner to be on Chris Hayes. That, obviously, well, there's, okay. There's there's the I problem. I tried to Photoshop that last night onto my own face, mm-hmm. 
and it was a fail. Okay, Look, we'll so. get we'll get we'll get uh, Joanne Reed's makeup people. There, oh, to, she's got the best. So see? I Just mean, saying. she's amazing. She looks beautiful every single night. But mm-hmm. anyway, um, I want you to talk about. Uh, you gave me a little quiz, Drift Glass. I did. And I Pop I quiz. got the answer right. You did, and I love you for it. <laughs> I hate my life for it, but I love you for it. Um, yeah, the, uh, well, Ezra Klein, you all know Ezra Klein from uh, the years he spent at the Washington Post, and he was actually on, he had his own show on for a while, I think, on MSNBC. He's one of, one of that club, and now he's at the New York Times, and one of the th- perks of working at the New York Times is you get to take, like, 17 months of, pater- of paternity leave, which is great. Um, so he's it's not been, 17 months, but it's no, a long time. It's several yeah. months of uh, paternity yeah. leave, and Good he's been on the him. job for about a minute. Congratulations on your yeah. new edition, yeah. And he, he has a series of podcasts he hosts on there, uh, most of which are just kind of I shake my head and go, OK, it's nice to live in a world where the everyday concerns of politics no longer affect you in any way. Um, but if I tell you the title and the subject of this week's episode, you should be able to guess the guest host. That's the quiz. Who's I replacing po- Ezra Klein yeah, he, for, well, the, for the week. He, yeah. He's putting in guests and, and colleagues and friends who are yeah. guest hosting for him every week, which is fine. Um, the title of this podcast, this episode of the Ezra Klein Show, is "Timeless Wisdom for Leading a Life of Love, Wisdom, and Friendship." So, wisdom is in there twice. Yes, um, and it's about love and friendship and wisdom. and And this is uh, this is the quote from uh, the conversation between Leon Cass, who's a teacher at the University of Chicago, and the mystery guest host is attempting to answer the meaning of it all. And that's when I guessed who it was. It's I it's, didn't need to hear the quote. I knew who it was. But it's you go so ahead. much bigger than just mere politics, blue gown. <laughs> it's about every fucking thing. I think and our, we're our answer. listeners know who it is by yes. now too. <laughs> and you got to and you got to do this with humility, or it doesn't sound right. <laughs> In big bold letters on a Broadway marquee, it's got to say humility. <laughs> I'm so goddamn humble. <laughs> All right. So this is a direct quote from the blurb, um, which I cracks me up. I don't know if it cracks you up. Along the way, they discuss the difference between choosing a career and discovering a vocation. The key ingredients of a successful romantic relationship. (laughs) How to distinguish between superficial friendships and life-altering ones. Why finding the right job is less about searching within ourselves and more about committing to something beyond ourselves. Cast views that The most distinctive thing about individuals isn't their race, gender, or class, but, quote, the ruling passions of their souls. And what the biblical Exodus story can teach Americans about how to live together more harmoniously. And now you know. It's David Brooks. Now you know it's David fucking Brooks. (laughs) And I just want to dial right in on how to have a successful romantic relationship. Because I want to hear from David Brooks. (laughs) That's where I cracked Step one. Jettison wife number one. Yeah. Jettison step number two. Lie about it for two years. Yeah, yeah. Don't step tell three, anybody you're divorced. Well, your yeah. friends know, and all everyone, everyone knew. I yeah. mean, I, I, I have a few claims to blogging fame. One of which was noticing before anybody else did that David Brooks was probably he wasn't divorced. wearing his wedding ring. Wasn't yeah. wearing his wedding ring. He was writing a lot of sad bastard columns about what it's like being alone and mm-hmm. living in a motel and living in a hotel <laughs> by yourself and standing outside a dance studio looking at all those beautiful young ladies dancing and I can't and oh like oh god oh and <laughs> that's way creepy from anybody but from you it's like super super creepy. Uh, the guy who wrote you know, column after column about the importance of marriage and staying married and the poor should get married because then their communities would be stable. Mm-hmm. Um, lied about his divorce yeah. and lied about it, lied about it until someone on uh, C-SPAN asked him, Charles Lamb, I think. Yeah. Oh, Brian Lamb, Brian Lamb. And David Brooks just like, well, yes, yeah, I, my lawyers say I can't talk about it. Um, well, okay. Uh, well, didn't you write about because a lot about you put your ex-wife into an NDA right. to get her divorce money? Right. That's why. And, you and can't didn't talk you write a lot it. of columns about the importance of marriage and how much? No, no, I never, never wrote anything like that. I never wrote <laughs> anything. I never wrote anything. <laughs> I never wrote about Iraq or George Bush or how deficits will never happen. That blah blah blah. blah no fair remembering stuff. Let's well, move and, on to the next. W- when I read this disc- this description because you gave this to me in writing mm-hmm. as a quiz, I thought, okay, so. Uh, Finding the right job is uh, more about vocation, but vocation means zero accountability for job right. performance. <laughs> well, and finding and your also, vocation. Oh, go ahead. I was, was going to say 
Finding your vocation means snuggling up with Bill Buckley so that he gives you a job. Right. Well, That's what your vocation the is. Individ- the, the important thing about individuals isn't their race, gender, or class, but the ruling class into which they were born. Yes. That's and really what it's about. That's, that's, <laughs> and the biblical story of Exodus. Right. Just oh, like, God. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he, he really is getting to be the Acela Corridor's, you know, mm-hmm. faith and freedom correspondent. Um, and that's fine. I don't think he should be any business doing it as the New York Times politics and culture critic. And I don't know what the fuck he's doing at the Atlantic, other than the fact that there's just nobody left out there who has, who's on the right, who has any more credibility at all. No, um, he's yeah. made enough friends and he's made, and he's mentored enough people and he's gotten en- enough people, you know, into media and, and groomed them that he has a dense network of people who are going to, he can just go from house to house collecting free meals until he drops yeah. dead. And, and no will. one will question his no. anything. Yeah. No. Cause, and he, he has the same excuse as Mark Meadows, which is, I was called by God to do this job. Right. And uh, if not me, there'd be someone worse doing it. So you All should right. just we're, be- We're cons- getting, we're running cl- up against our clock now. Um, okay. Well, I want to hear about dueling governors, Blue Gal. Briefly, uh, this whole Supreme Court thing of them throwing a bomb onto Roe v. Wade and then saying, well, do whatever you want whatever. about suing people or- we're not going to make any more strong statements about it because because they know what they've done to the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. So they want they want to stop abortions and gum up the works as much as possible for anyone seeking a legal abortion. But they they want it to be as confusing as possible to the rest of us. Right. They don't, they don't want you to make a federal case out of it, which is, you know, <laughs> which it literally is a federal it literally case. is. Yeah. <laughs> But this whole thing of the vigilante part of it, yeah, which they don't like either, but it's part of the law. And yeah, you, you know, the the, <laughs> the Planned Parenthood clinics and abortion clinics can reach into their vast wealth to sue, to right. hire lawyers to sue the state of Texas if they want. Um, but other governors, as predicted, are jumping on this opportunity to make things that states are not supposed to be able to legislate and just saying, okay, but citizens can sue. Uh And Gavin Newsom in California is going after gun manufacturers in this way and saying people who, let's face it in court, if someone's been shot in your family, you are a legitimately harmed person Yes, to go into the court and say something about guns. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so good for him. That I think that's an actual victim plaintiff situation. But then Ron DeSantis has said, we're going to let uh, anybody go in and spy on a school teacher. Right. And if they're teaching that critical race theory, then uh, you can sue them. Yeah. Sue them for damages, for harm, for no, just for money. Um, and I know what I would do if I, you know, I, I have an education degree. Yes, you I've do. been a student teacher. I've done I've done the classroom stuff, and uh, if I was a teacher in Florida and this be- this bill passes, I just live stream everything out in the classroom. Yeah, yep. and you know if you can watch from home, you can watch on YouTube. It's just it's live. My classroom's live. Watch, and when we get into conversations and issues of race are brought up by students, not me. And I will just sit there and say, under state law, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Discuss mm-hmm. among yourselves. Yep. And yep. watch the TikTok generation talk about race for an oh, hour for the yeah. 50 minutes I have. And and what teacher and they don't doesn't... Have to, I don't have to have their faces on the camera. I mean, I know no. student liability and privacy and so forth. We'll, sure. po- we'll point the camera at the wall while students are talking. And we'll listen to them talk about race. And what's what teacher doesn't want to provoke an interesting conversation with their students. Yeah. Really. A, a, any teacher really Why wants to Why do you become do a that. social studies teacher except to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did a, a little thing on social media, or I know somebody who did a, a thing on social media, a, a close friend of mine, a charming guy on social media, um, who said that the, the Florida plan is to have sirens go off and the offending school go on active CRT lockdown. 
Anytime any teacher starts <laughs> talking about history or civil rights in America, parents will receive text alerts and told to pick up their children immediately. And of course, <laughs> licensed CRT grief counselors will be dispatched to the school the next day <laughs> for right. any student who may need professional assistance dealing uh, with their with their trauma. You're going way too close to on the anniversary of Sandy Hook. I I, I understand very that. dangerous places. Oh well, but that's what <laughs> that's how they're treating that's this. That's how they're treating it. They're treating this they're as treating if the it. worst thing that could happen to a student in school is to learn about American civil rights history. Right, we have to do right. everything in our power to stop that. Right. Right. And the way you stop that is by getting rid of fucking Republicans in any position of authority anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. just my opinion. Well, and don't forget that as far as most of Florida is part of the Confederacy. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I would like to hear you talk about the Hannity defense. I thought that oh. was extremely incisive and cool. Well, Midas Touch has a terrific video showing uh Fox News hosts this week talking about privacy and how dare they read my text messages juxtaposed with them reading Peter Strzok's text messages. Yeah. Yeah. Hillary Clinton's emails would like a word with Sean Hannity about <laughs> privacy. Yep. And Hillary Clinton had a tweet today about, you know, my personal emails were about gefilte fish. Right. Your text yeah. messages were about overturning a free and fair election and flipping democracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a very good uh, op-ed by Philip Bump in the Washington Post where he takes apart 10 minutes of Tucker Carlson transcript. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Yeah, Tucker said, we now live in a country where none of your private communications are safe from the eyes of power drunk politicians like Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney can harness the awesome power of the national security state to seize your personal text messages and then read them into the congressional record. And guess what? There's nothing you can do about it, Mr. Citizen. Except, as Philip Bump pointed out in the Washington Post, Mark Meadows' text messages were subpoenaed. Right. As part of an investigation by mm -hmm. Congress. And it all went through legal channels. And it was approved by, you know, the courts that you can subpoena this information. And uh, I just want to know for Tucker Carlson, how's that Patriot Act of George W. Bush working out for you? Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, that Philip Bump article. Yeah. Um, is preceded with a paragraph. As I recall, I'm not looking at it, but it's preceded with a paragraph that's 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 cropping up. Like Dana Milbank had a similar one mm -hmm. today, which is, I know this won't do any good. Right. Oh yeah. Who said that? Yep. Um, I know. I know I, how I, impervious I, to reason or argument or uh, counterpoint the right wing media echo chamber is. I know but, that. But let me do this for the people who are who are reading. And that's fine. This yeah. is what our, our podcast is sort of lives in that right. same space. But it, it's that well, first paragraph that I think requires um, – that should be the subject of a panel discussion among right. media professionals like to you whom, and I. As you were always asking the question, yeah. argue to whom? And to whom? at least they're not acknowledging that they know who they're, who the argument is going to be absorbed by. And, um, and then the next question in that cycle would be, and how did it get this way? And that's yeah. the question that everyone in the media, virtually everyone in the media, and certainly all of our Never Trump friends want to avoid like – Omicron virus because right, right. they don't want to talk about how, well, actually we did this, you know, we, yeah. we on the right did this with our fucked up crazy media that we were all part of. And in the center, we did this with explaining every Republican atrocity away as both sides being wrong. Mm -hmm. That's and what then, caused And then this. treating our friends at Fox because they are great people at Fox. They're great people. There's lots of great and, people. And there, that was sure. when these text messages came out and you, you said, nothing's going to change by this. They're just going to circle the wagons. Right. I said, if anything changes up about this, it will be, it puts an end to the, there are great people on Fox on the air, people making that argument. And how long until we start hearing the liberal Chris Wallace- yeah, right, um, right. Somewhere when he says something bad. Well, he's or on provocative. CNN now, so yeah. of course he's liberal. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, that happens anytime anyone who is an actual news person sort of uh -huh. leaves Fox. Um, there's always a wish list that comes out from right wing tweet tweeter people of, and the next person I want to leave Fox is, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're the ones you know. It's their democracy; they get to vote on who appears on Fox. Right, yeah, it's sure. their network. Well, and and I told the story, I'm sure, a couple of times of 
when uh, Megan Kelly's star was falling. Mm-hmm. You know, when, mm-hmm. when her when her when her stardom was waning. Yeah. I have I have there's local wing nuts I talked to. Yeah. And they yeah. were and she had done something like, you know, mildly criticized Donald Trump during right. the during the run up to the election. During the and debate. It was like, yeah. They were they were she was dead to them. They yeah. like this Tucker guy. This Tucker guy makes a lot of sense. But this blonde chick, she's as bad as that lesbian on MSNBC. <laughs> and they wow. would drop you that fast because, yeah. because, let me repeat, they were trained to dump anyone who tells them anything they don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. That's the doomsday machine that you all built. And it's doing exactly what you designed it to do. It's it's functioning as designed. Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. Shall we go to the news roundup? Yeah, I want to... Uh, applaud the January 6th commission oh, yeah. though, yeah, yeah. for recognizing when to put Liz Cheney on television uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and also recognizing um, the what? Who's on television now, Drift Glass? Uh, it's, well, it's, it's Nicole Wallace, but the Chiron reads, ex-Fox contributor Jonah Goldberg, quote, I didn't want to be complicit in so many lies. <laughs> The this is his of, thing. This the is the author thing. of liberal fascism. Liberal didn't fascism. Want to be complicit in so many lies. Yeah, he's the hero of the revolution now. Sure, he's well. David Brooks said, you know, it seems like two minutes ago, but it was probably four or five years ago that Jonah Goldberg was going to be in the vanguard of the conservative intellectual renaissance. That's the guy. He'll lead us into the promised land. Like you guys are so just fun. rubbing each other off all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, anyway, I'll say sorry. It. Sorry for the interruption. Now you can okay. exactly locate this moment in history to know when <laughs> I went, oh. It's 4.13 in the afternoon central time mm-hmm. in the cornfield. In the cornfield. Time stamp. Here we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, no, I got to applaud the January 6th commission for recognizing and really driving home the point in their speeches and in their conversations that there is a crime of obstructing Congress as they perform a constitutional duty. Yes, there is. And that's the crime by, and, and as Liz Cheney said, by inaction or action, obstructing the Congress is a crime. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, we've got a, a thing to go after. This is the crime that was committed Mm -hmm. is for 187 minutes through inaction, Donald Trump obstructed the Congress doing their constitutional duty. Yep. Um, and he was waiting to see if they hung Mike Pence yeah. and or if if somehow the the election got overturned. He was just waiting to see if it would succeed or not before well, he called them off. And he I, I, I believe this has been speculated about and I, mm-hmm. I have no evidence one way or the other because that those people haven't been questioned yet. Uh huh. But that he was waiting for something to go bang. Yeah. And that he could declare a national emergency right. and send to the National Guard and seize control of the Congress. Mm-hmm. And and then we can throw this we into the Supreme Court. have to have an election do over or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But it was all, the, you know, there was there was a moment there. But for the man who was not the man of the year in Time Magazine, but should have been, the security guard who led the mob away from the, from uh, the Senate, from the yeah. Senate, from the place where Pence and people like that were sitting. Yeah. If that had gone slightly differently, um, Trump would have had an excuse to declare Martial, martial law, law. Yeah. yeah and yeah. then we're and then and and they they have the same mindset all of these fuckers have the same mindset they had after watergate which was it wasn't a mistake to do the crime it was a mistake not to burn the tapes right it was a right. mistake not to do the coup better right that's the mistake we should have been more thorough in our planning and preparation and execution of overthrowing the government right right Coor- more coordination in our uh-huh. powerpoint yeah that does it yeah <laughs> All right, let's do a news roundup. From CNBC, the four-week moving average for new unemployment claims totaled 203,750, the lowest level since November 15, 1969. A year ago, more than 21 million Americans were on unemployment. Today, that number is below 2 million. Mm -hmm. Biden boom. It's the Biden boom. Are we sure that those are people that are now working? or I mean, do we have a sense that this is... This is a boom and not just unemployment running out. Uh, that's you know? a good question. C- CNBC did not tell me these things, um, but I will go look it up. I'm guessing there are a whole lot more people with work than they than they had last time. Yeah, um, there just has to be because th- there are restaurants opening. There are right. there's you know help wanted signs hanging out everywhere. 
Well, um, and Christmas sales are up massively. Yeah. So that means that delivery workers and shop workers and so forth are. Look, employed. all I know is this with, with my complete lack of qualification to do anything but podcast, I can go out today and get a job at Walmart greeting people at the door and no questions asked. I no probably wouldn't have asked. to. Probably wouldn't have to pass a urine test. I don't know. But youngest child works at a discount retailer. Yes. Warehouse type store. Yes. And uh, she had to ring up a woman who spent over a thousand dollars in one shopping trip. It took her twenty minutes to ring up this woman's purchases. I, I won't tell her, but I'll tell you. I so want to apply for work there. <laughs> Should and kill you and be a she trainee. She'd kill you. I understand that that young lady's a good trainer, so I'd like to be trained <laughs> by her on the cash register protocols. I can't do it. Which and button do I push again? I'm sorry. <laughs> and at, you know, tipping my glasses to my nose and staring way down at the keyboard. <laughs> I'm sorry. Which button does the undo? <laughs> She'd kill you. Yeah, she would. She, she won't would. let me shop there. <laughs> I know you can't. There, you there, can't. Are, you cannot cross this threshold. No. No. Um. <laughs> Back to the news. Mark Meadows turned over a PowerPoint presentation, as we mentioned, suggesting that Trump could declare a national security emergency in order to delay the certification of the 2020 election to the House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. A version of the PowerPoint, which spanned 38 pages and was titled Election Fraud, Foreign Interference and Options for 6 January, was sent to Meadows on January 5th and recommended that Trump declare a national emergency, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seize paper ballots, and for all electronic voting to be rendered invalid, citing foreign control of electronic voting systems. And someone reminded me the other day that this was the third Stop the Steal rally in Washington, D.C. I had forgotten. Yeah. January 6th was the big one. It's going to be wild, et cetera, et cetera. But there were uh -huh. two other rallies for Stop the Steal in December. Mm-hmm. All right. The House of Representatives voted to hold Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress over his refusal to cooperate with the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Former White House trade advisor Pete <sighs> Navarro refused to comply with the congressional subpoena for documents related to the Trump administration's response to the coronavirus. Navarro said Trump ordered him not to turn over documents or share information about the White House coronavirus response, citing a, quote, direct order to claim executive privilege. Because, yeah, all the coronavirus shit is top secret state secret shit that nobody should be allowed to see. President Joe Biden plans a forceful push for voting rights, but we don't know what's happening with Build Back Better. Yeah, well, it's probably going to be the, pushed off. The House Progressive Caucus could have told you that. Yeah, they did tell you that. And, they told you that. And what's more, um, I am just, um, I guess, sort of, bemused and amused again the predictability of all things you know mm -hmm. becomes its own source of amusement after a while how many people on hell sites like twitter insist that joe biden use his magic green lantern powers right oh i know to, to magically pass this shit or if he doesn't then the democratic party doesn't care about voting rights right it's like right. no it's two assholes it's two senate assholes really one and a half because if mansion cave you can push cinema around a little bit but it's basically Joe Manchin is holding the country hostage. The and coal blaming, magnate Maserati houseboat yeah. owner. Yes. And if you're blaming the 48 hostages and not the guy holding the fucking gun, then you're doing it wrong. Um, this week, Hugh Hewitt, you know, cyborg sent from the future to destroy <laughs> America, moderated a Minnesota GOP gubernatorial debate. And the first question he asked was, did Biden legitimately win the 2020 election? And none of the five candidates with it came within a mile of saying yes. Because they're afraid of being shot. Yeah. Yeah. They're afraid of what happens if they leave the room having yeah. declared that Donald Trump actually lost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. An actual Washington Post headline, prosecuting Donald Trump's former chief of staff could create a precedent that hurts the Justice Department later. Yeah. I thought really thought that was Doug J. Balloon. I really yeah. did until I read, oh, God, it's the actual Washington Post. Yeah. Yeah. Enforcing the law on the chief of staff might cause Republicans to retaliate in the future. Well, no, they don't have to retaliate because they're just going to seize control of the government by force. So they don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. 
A federal judge has dismissed Donald Trump's lawsuit seeking to block Congress from obtaining his tax returns. And they gave him two weeks to appeal. I really thought they were trolling him. <laughs> you can appeal in two weeks. Within yeah. two weeks, yeah. sir. Uh, the walls are closing in on all sides. Talks between Biden and Joe Manchin reportedly soured over the size and scope of the $1.75 trillion. By the way, that is the compromise. That's really been compromised down a lot. A lot. Climate and social safety net legislation. Manchin continued to push for spending reductions, in lo including eliminating the measure's expanded child tax credit, a federal program that sends monthly tax credit checks to roughly 35 million families with young mm -hmm. children. The final tax credit payments went out today, and the program is set to expire at the end of this year unless lawmakers reauthorize it as part of the Build Back Better Act, or they could do it separately, too. They could. But Biden does, but Manchin doesn't seem in, to be interested in doing that in any no, way. No, Manchin wants poor families to suffer, and he doesn't want to debate the Pentagon no, bill. What he, what he wants is a world without entitlements. And right. if he was... Around in in the mid '60s, he would have voted against Medicare and Social Security. Of course, he would, because so, he's that's that's he's a product of his state. Yep, he's a product of his past, and he is the man holding everything you value hostage. Mm -hmm. It's not Joe Biden. It's not Kamala Harris. It's not Pete Buttigieg. It's none of those people. It's one guy from West Virginia holding everyone else hostage, and he gets to do that mm -hmm. because that's how the Senate works. Uh, the U.S. surpassed 800,000 COVID deaths. We are now uh, have suffered more COVID deaths than any other nation. I want to say one more thing about Joe Manchin. Sure. I've said it before. D. Manchin, the Senate. Three more Democrats yep. in the Senate. Yep. And we can, we can do it. The calendar and the map this year for 2022 mm -hmm. is good for us. Yeah. And we can do it. But, we have to do it. But that's, you know, we have to. I and mean, I, and the, the, whoever is the Senate candidate for each of those places, whoever wins the Democratic primary, that needs to be their promise. I promise to be the 51st vote Yeah, that ends the filibuster and gets things done. That's it, that's it. It worked for Scott, what's his name, in Massachusetts, right? Scott Brown? Yeah. I promise yeah. to be the 51st vote against, against Obamacare. Obamacare. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I promise me the 51st vote that will ensure voting rights are not trampled on by the fascists across the aisle from me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the CDC warned that the Omicron variant is rapidly spreading in the United States and that everything points to a large wave coming as soon as January. Get that booster shot. Get it, Get the shot. Get all the shots. Get all the shots. 60% uh, of Americans say they feel worn out by how COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their daily lives and 45% feel angry about it. I want to know who the other 40% are who aren't worn out by it. Yeah, Because I'd really? like to talk to them and find out what they're drinking because I'd like some of that. I'd Thank like you very much. I'd like something to drink with it. Mm -hmm. that I'll have what she's having, right? Mm -hmm. I feel particularly bad for our kids in, those, in their age cohort. Oh. I, I, 20s, in their 20s, trying being, to figure they're out. They're being robbed. They're being robbed yeah. of really important years of their lives. Yeah. And I yeah. wish there was something we could do about it personally. Uh, and we take a look at what the upcoming gubernatorial campaign will sound like from our local talk radio show station, WMAY. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a good glimpse of this depressing political future this week when the Republican candidate for governor, Darren Bailey, introduced his running mate, a black female conservative talk radio hostess named Stephanie Trussell. In her initial speech as a candidate for lieutenant governor of Illinois, Trussell said this, we need to get the woke left political agenda out of our classrooms once and for all. It's time to teach our kids to chase their dreams, not to be a victim or hate one another. Could and you please this, go on. <laughs> oh, sure. This this is um, we're reading from an editorial and the voice there are not in quotes is the voice of uh, uh, Jim Leach, the guy who wrote the editorial. Uh, I think we would all agree that children should not be taught in school to be a victim or hate one another. It's a good thing that isn't happening anywhere. We asked Trussell to identify where exactly such horrendous things are being taught. Her response, everywhere. <laughs> well, if you're going to try to dupe people, you might as well go all in. 
But Trussell's claim is patently uh, is patent nonsense and an insult to hardworking educators all across the state. When pressed for details about this supposed indoctrination of helpless students, Trussell offered a vague anecdote claiming that teachers in her hometown school district are being, quote, targeted because they have a back-the-blue flag in their classroom. That, of course, is not the same thing as children being told their victims are being taught to hate one another. It's also not a story that shows up in any recent news accounts. Yeah, you can Google back-the-blue-flag classroom and find nothing. Yeah. So, basically, we have a little Trump wingnut Mm -hmm. hiring Mm -hmm. another little Trump wingnut to run by his side because she's black and female. Uh, and they're going to run on critical, race, critical theory, race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory, all the live long day. That's racist, Drift Glass. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm known for it, Blue Gal. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week we have two internet pets, Kiki the cat and Dash the greyhound dog. Ooh. Their owner has been rescuing greyhounds for 27 years. But when Kiki showed up as a stray cat, the greyhounds quickly accepted her as a member of the pack. (laughs) It's easy to see why Kiki clearly stores the fat cells that Dash isn't already burning off. (laughs) It's a a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kiki, the vet says, is about 18 years old. Wow. So she's in great shape. And we are so glad to have her and her friend Dash. And and they're sleeping on the big bed in this picture. So, you you know, because, of course, they are. Well, Dash is a big dog. Dash is a big dog, and and he leaves plenty of space for Kiki Mm -hmm. (laughs) so so she can get her rest. Uh, But uh, they they are this week's Internet Pets, and we're so glad to have them. And, of course, Kiki and Dash eat freshly poured pet food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve Pet Store Perfection or Dollar Store Drek, your pets will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Kiki and Dash at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com. Usually when people, by the way, send multiple pets on a picture i write back and ask them to send individual pictures of individual pets Mm -hmm. because that gives us more pets (laughs) to fill the weeks but this picture of kiki and dash was so cute that we are we're keeping them together in this case they're they're inseparable what do you want what do you want they share the big bed yeah abbott without costello that's insane So send your internet pet to proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We do love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag fired joy already. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And we love our job. Uh, Drift Class, we discovered this week that over the course of almost 12 years of podcasting, yes, we have had over 6 million downloads of this show. Yeah, you're lying. Now you're just no, lying. No, I'm not. Nobody, nah. I'm my, so excited. <laughs> I'm sorry, but my brother and sister can't download that fast. That, 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 that fast. Never has well, your to be mom, wrong. you know, well, your late mother did a lot of them. I know. Well, yeah, 3 million of those are just her downloading them <laughs> over and over again. You're doing great, son. You're doing great, (laughs) daughter-in-law. Anyway, we appreciate you guys downloading the show over and over again. And, uh, you know, the hardest thing for a fundraiser to accomplish is to get somebody who donates nothing to donate five bucks. That is, that's the big cliff. That is. So please think about it this this time of year, especially Mm -hmm. if you listen to the show regularly and you've never contributed. It's not difficult. We make it very easy for you. You have many options. Mm-hmm. Think about sending us five bucks. Think about sending us what you think the podcast is worth. We have not made a dollar per download. <laughs> we're, uh, we're, you know, just two people living in a very small house in South Central Illinois. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'd love to visit with you and have coffee with you if you're in the area. 
And uh, we really do appreciate your support. We, what, we thank you. What Blue Gal's yeah. trying to say is, don't make us go to Substack. <laughs> and don't make us hook up with Legal Zoom. Oh, my and God. And bombard you with ads every five Blue minutes. Blue Apron, Legal yeah. Zoom, all yeah. those things. No, we're, we're not going that route. Look, we have enough fake sponsors who are already feeling left out of each <laughs> show because we don't bring them up as much as we used well, to. Well, and we... it, kind of, it kind of broke my heart watching that Chris Hayes interview because mm-hmm. those guys are self-promoters. Yeah. Who are are not uh, shy no. about putting their hand out and saying, "Give us money, money, please, right. money, you know? please." Mm-hmm. Uh, and those kind of people get millions of dollars and and they do book deals and so forth. And mm-hmm. I don't want to become that kind of person. No. I just that's not who I am. So, no. well, this uh, is this is this is a cause first for us, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and a and a job you know, a, an income job second, but mm-hmm. without the second thing, the first thing doesn't happen. Right. So. Right. I don't want to have to go looking for work apart from doing what I do. Right. Because of where we're at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you guys for supporting us and making this yeah. possible. Very much. Very yeah. much. And please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please get someone else to listen to. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Drop Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties want you to know that they have never, ever texted Mark Meadows. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovin'. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.